poems by Rayer Maria Rilke. Translated by Jesse Lamont. With an introduction by H.T. To the memory of August Roden through whom I came to know Rainer Maria Rilke. Acknowledgement. To the editors of Poetry, a magazine of verse and poet lore, the translator is indebted for permission to reprint certain poems in this book, also to the compilers of the following anthologies, Amphor. I edited by Thomas Bird Moser, the Catholic Anthology of World Poetry, selected by Carl Van Doren. The Poetry of Rainer Maria Rilke The supreme problem of every age is that of finding its consummate artistic expression. Before this problem every other remains of secondary importance. History defines and directs its physical course, science cooperates in the achievement of its material aims, but art alone gives to the age its spiritual physiognomy, its ultimate and lasting expression. The process of art is on the one hand sensuous the conception, having for its basis the fineness of organization, of the senses and on the other hand it is severely scientific. The value of the creation being dependent upon the craftsmanship, the mastery over the tool, the technique. Art, like nature, its great and only reservoir for all time past and all time to come ever strives for elimination and selection. It is severe and aristocratic in the application of its laws and impervious to appeal to serve other than its own aims. Its purpose is the symbolization of life. In its sanctum there reigns the silence of vast accomplishment, the serene, final and imperturbable solitude which is the ultimate criterion of all great things created. To speak of poetry is to speak of the most subtle, the most delicate and the most accurate instrument by which to measure life. Poetry is reality's essence, visioned and made manifest by one endowed with a perception acutely sensitive to sound, form, and color, and gifted with a power to shape into rhythmic and rhymed verbal symbols the reaction to life phenomenon. The poet molds that which appears evanescent and ephemeral in image and in mood into everlasting values. In this act of creation, he serves eternity. Poetry in a special lyrical poetry must be acknowledged the supreme art, culminating as it does in a union of the other arts, the musical, the plastic, and the pictorial. The most eminent contemporary poets of Europe have each in accordance with his individual temperament reflected in their work the spiritual essence of our age, its fears and failures, its hopes and high achievements matterlink with his mood of resignation and his retirement into a dusky twilight where his shadowy figures move noiselessly like phantoms in Phelan Dimas. Them, the worshipper of will with his passion for materiality and the beauty of all things physical and tangible Verheren, the visionary of a new vitality, who sees in the toilers of fields and factories the hero gesture of our time and who might have written its great epic of industry but for the overwhelming lyrical mood of his soul. Until a few years ago known only to a relatively small community on the continent, but commanding an ever-increasing attention which has borne his name far beyond the boundary of his country. The personality of Rainer Maria Rilke stands today beside the most illustrious poets of modern Europe. The background against which the figure of Rainer Maria Rilke is silhouetted is so varied the influences which have entered into his life are so manifold that a study of his work however slight must needs take into consideration the elements through which this poet has matured into a great master. Prague, the city in which Rook was born in 1875, with its sinister palaces and crumbling towers that rose in the early Middle Ages and have reached out into our time like the threatening fingers of mighty hands which have wielded swords for generations and which are stained with the blood of many wounds of many races. The city where, amid grey old ruins, blonde maidens are at play or are lost in reverie in the green cool parks and shady gardens with which the Bohemian capital abounds. This Prague of mingled grotesqueness and beauty gave to the young boy his first impressions. There is a period in the life of every artist when his whole being seems lost in a contemplation of the surrounding world, when the application to work is difficult like the violent forcing of something that is awaiting its time. This is the time of his dream as sacred as the days of early spring before wind and rain and light have touched the fruits of the fields when there is a tense bleak silence over the whole of nature, in which is wrapped the strength of storms and the glow of the summer sun. 
this is the time of his deepest dream and upon this dream and its guarding depends the final realization of his life's work a young graduate of the gymnasium was to enter upon the career of an army officer in accordance with the traditions of the family an old noble house which traces its lineage far back to carinthian ancestry his inclinations, however, pointed so decisively in the direction of the finer arts of life that he left a military academy after a very short attendance to devote himself to the study of philosophy and the history of art. As one turns the pages of Rook's first small book of poems, published originally under the title Lair and Offer in the year 1895, and which appeared in more recent editions under the less descriptive name Erst Get It, one realizes at once in spite of a lack of plasticity in the presentation that here speaks one who has lingered long and lovingly over the dream of his boyhood as the title indicates these poems are a tribute and offering to the lairs the home spirits of his native town rug and the surrounding country are the ever-recurring theme of almost every one of these poems the meadows, the maidens, the dark river in the evening, the spires of the cathedral at night rising like grey mist are seen with a wonderment, the great wellspring of all poetic imagination with a well-knit religious piety. Through all these poems there sounds like a subdued accompaniment, a note of gratitude for the ability to thus vision the world, to be sunk in the music of all things. Without is everything that I feel within myself, and without and within myself everything is immeasurable, illimitable. These pictures of town and landscape are never separated from their personal relation to the poet. He feels too keenly his dependence upon them as a child, views flowers and stars as personal possessions. Not until later was he to reach the height of an impersonal objectivity in his art. What distinguishes these early poems from similar adolescent productions is the restraint in the presentation the economy and intensity of expression and the quality of listening to the inner voice of things which renders the poet the seer of mankind the second book of poems appeared two years later and like the first volume trangicrant is full of the music that is reminiscent of the mild melancholy of the bohemian folk songs in whose gentle rhythms the barbaric strength of the race seems to be lulled to rest as the waves of a faraway tumultuous sea gently lap the shore the themes of Trondekrant are extended somewhat beyond the immediate environment of Prague, and some of the most beautiful poems are luminous pictures of villages hidden in the snowy blossoming of May, and June and out of which rises here and there the solitary soft voice of a boy or girl singing. In these first two volumes the poet is satisfied with painting in words, full of sonorous beauty, the surrounding world. From this period dates the small poem evening which seems to have been sketched by a Japanese painter, so clear and colorful is its texture, so precious and precise are its outlines. With Advent and Mirrors of Fear both published within the following three years a phase of questioning commences, a dim desire begins to stir to reach out into the larger world. Whereas the early poems were characterized by a tendency to turn away from the turmoil of life, in fact the concrete world of reality does not seem to exist there is noticeable in these two later volumes and advance toward life in a sense that the poet is beginning to approach and to vision some of its greatest symbols. Throughout the entire work of Roque in his poetry as well as in his interpretations of painting and sculpture, there are two elements that constitute the cornerstones and the structure of his art. If, as has been said with a degree of verity, Nietzsche was primarily a musician whose philosophy had for its basis and took its ultimate aspects from the musical quality of his artistic endowment, it may be maintained with an equal amount of truth that Rilke is primarily a painter and sculptor whose poetry rests upon the fundaments of the pictorial and plastic arts. Up to the time of the publication of these volumes, Rook's poems possessed a quietude of stillness suggested in the straight and broken yet delicate lines of the picture which he portrays and in the soft, almost unpulsing rhythm of his words. The approach of evening or nightfall, the coming of dawn, the change of the seasons, the slow changes of light into darkness and of darkness into light, in short, the most silent yet greatest metamorphoses in the external aspects of nature form the contents of many of these first poems. The inanimate object and the living creature in nature are not seen in the sharp contours of their isolation, they are viewed and interpreted in the atmosphere that surrounds them.
in which they are enwrapped and so densely veiled that the outlines are only dimly visible, be that atmosphere the mystic gray of northern twilight or the dark velvety blue of southern summer nights. In Advent the experience of the atmosphere becomes an experience in his innermost soul and, therefore, all things become of value to him only in so far as they partake of the atmosphere as they are seen in a peculiar air and distance. This first phase in Rilke's work may be defined as the phase of reposeful nature. To this sphere of relaxation and restfulness in which the objects are static and are changed only as the surrounding atmosphere affects them. The second phase in the poet's development adds another element which later was to grow into dimensions so powerful, so violently breaking bond the limitations of simple expression in words that it could only find its satisfaction in a dithyrambic hymn to the work of the great plastic artist of our time, to the creations of August Rodin. This second element is that which the French sculptor in a different medium has carried to perfection. It is the element of gesture of dramatic movement. This might seem the appropriate place in which to speak of Rilke's monograph on the art of Rodin. To do so would however be an undue anticipation, for it will be necessary to trace Rilke's development through several transitions before the value of his contact with the work of Rodin can be fully measured. A gesture the movement begins in Advent and celebration to disturb the stillness prevailing in the first two volumes of poems. Even here it is only gentle and shy at first like the stirring of a breath of wind over a quiet sea and gentle beings make this first gesture, children and young women at play, singing, dancing or at prayer. Particularly in the cycle songs of the maidens in the book celebration, the atmosphere is condensed and becomes the psychic background of the landscape against which the gesture of longing or expectation is seen and felt. It is the impatience to burst into blossoming the longing for love which pulsates in these songs of the maidens with the tenseness of suspense. The prayers of the maidens to Mary have not the mild melody of maidenly prayer, they vibrate with an ecstasy of expectant life, and the Madonna is more than the heavenly virgin. Their longing transforms her into the symbol of earthly love and motherhood. This expectation in spite of its intensity is subdued and is only heard like the cadence of a far-off dream. How shall I go on tiptoe from childhood to annunciation through the dim twilight into thy garden? Mention should be made of some prose writings which Rook published in the year 1898 and shortly afterward. They are two stories of Prague, The Touch of Life, and the last three volumes of short stories, a twerked drama, The Daily Life, points to a strong Metterlink influence, and finally stories of God. With both beauty of detail and problematic interest, the short stories show an incoherence of treatment and a lack of dramatic coordination easily conceivable in a poet who is essentially lyrical and who at that time had not mastered the means of technique to give to his characters the clear chiseling of the epic form. A sojourn in Russia and especially the acquaintance with the novels of Dostoevsky became potent factors in Rook's development and served to deepen creations which without this influence might have terminated in a grandiose thesia. Broadly speaking, Russian art and literature may be described as springing from an ethical impulse and as having for their motive power and race and detri the tendency towards sociopolitical reform. In contradistinction to the art and literature of Western culture, whose motives and aims are primarily of an aesthetic nature, and seek in art the reconciliation of the dualism between spirit and matter. Dostoevsky, whom Mirakovsky describes somewhere as the man with a never young face, the face with its shadows of suffering and its wrinkles of sunken in cheeks, but that which gives to this face its most tortured expression is its seeming immobility, the suddenly interrupted impulse, the life hardened into a stone. This Dostoevsky, and particularly his road in Raskolnikov's cycle, became a profound artistic experience to Rilke. The poor, the outcasts, the homeless ones received for him a new significance, the significance of the isolated figure placed in the mighty ever-changing current of a life in which this figure stands strong and solitary. In the poem entitled Pont du Carousel, written in Paris a few years later, Rilke has visioned the blind beggar aloof amid the fluctuating crowds of the metropolis. Russia became for me the reality and the deep daily realization that reality is something that comes infinitely slowly to those who have patience.
Russia is the country where men are solitary, each one with a world within himself, each one profound in his humbleness and without fear of humiliating himself, and because of it truly pious. Here the words of men are only fragile bridges above their real life. The great symbols of solitude and of death enter into the poet's work. In the first decade of the new century, Rilke reached the height of his art, and with a few exceptions, the poems represented in this volume are selected from the poems which were published between the years 1900 and 1908. An ascent toward the acme of Rilke's art after the year 1900 is as rapid as it is precipitous. Only a few years previous, we read in Advent, that is longing to dwell in the flux of things, to have no home in the present. And these are wishes, gentle dialogues of the poor hours with eternity. With das, but der builder, the dream is ended, the veil of mist is lifted, and before us are revealed pictures and images that rise before our eyes in clear, colorful contours. Whether the poet conjures from the depths of mythic kings and legends, or whether we read from the chronicle of a monk the awe inspiring description of the Last Judgment Day, or whether in Paris on a Palm Sunday we see the maidens at confirmation, the pictures presented stand out with the clearness and finality of the typical. It is a significant fact that Rilke dedicated this book to Gerhard Hauptmann. And love and gratitude for his Michael Kramer. Hauptmann, like Rilke in these poems, has placed before us great epic figures and his art is so concentrated that often the simple expression of the thought of one of his characters produces a shudder in the listener or reader because in this thought there vibrates the suffering of an entire social class and in it resounds the sorrow of many generations. In the book of pictures, Rilke's art reaches its culmination on what might be termed its monumental side. The visualization is elevated to the impersonal objective level which gives to the rhythm of these poems an imperturbable calm, to the figures presented a monumental erectness. The men of the House of Colonna, the Tsars, Charles, say, riding through the Ukraine are portrayed each with his individual historical gesture with a luminosity as strong as the color and movement which they gave to their time. In the mythical poem, Kings and Legends, this concrete element in the art of Rilke has found perhaps its supreme expression. Kings and old legends seem like mountains rising in the evening light. They blind all with their gleam, their loins encircled are by girdles bright, their robes are edged with bands of precious stones, the rarest earth affords with richly jeweled hands, they hold their slender, shining, naked swords. There are in the book of pictures poems in which this will to concentrate a mood into its essence, and finality is applied to purely lyrical poems as an initiation, that stands out in this volume like the self so immeasurable is the straight line of its aspiration reaching into the far distant silence of the night or as in the poem entitled Autumn with its melancholy mood of gentle descent in all nature. In the book of ours, Rook withdraws from the world, not from weariness, but weighed down under the manifold conflicting visions. As the prophet who would bring to the world a great possession, must go forth into the desert to be alone until the kingdom comes to him from within. So the poet must leave the world in order to gain the deeper understanding, to be face to face with God. The mood of Das Stundenbach is this mood of being face to face with God. It elevates these poems to prayer, profound prayer of doubt and despair, exalted prayer of reconciliation and triumph. The Book of Hours contains three parts written at different periods in the poet's life, the Book of a Monk's Life, 1899, the Book of Pilgrimage, 1901, and the Book of Poverty and Death, 1903. Although the entire volume was not published until several years later, the book of ours glows with a mystic fervor to know God, to be near Him. And this desire to approach the nameless one, the young brother in the book of a monk's life, builds up about God parables, images, and legends reminiscent of those of the 17th century Angelus Salicis, but sustained by a more pregnant language because exalted by a more ardent visionary force. The motif of the monk's life is expressed in a poem beginning with the lines I live my life in circles that grow wide and endlessly unroll. Through the gray cell of the young monk there flash in luminous magnificence the colors of the great Renaissance masters, for he feels in Titian and Michelangelo and Raphael the same fervor that animates him they too are worshippers of the same God. 
There are poems and the book of pilgrimage of the stillness of a whispered prayer in a great cathedral, and there are others that carry in their exaltation the music of mighty hymns. The visions in this second book are no less ecstatic though less glowingly colorful, they have withdrawn inward and have brought a great peace and a great faith as in the poem of God, whose very manifestation is the coitude and hush of a silent world. By day thou art the legend and the dream that like a whisper floats about all men the deep and brooding stillnesses which seem after the hour has struck too close again. And when a day with drowsy gesture bends and sinks to sleep beneath the evening skies as from each roof a tower of smoke ascends, so does thy realm, my God, round me rise. The last part of the Book of Hours, the Book of Poverty and Death, is finally a symphony of variations on the two great symbolic themes in the work of Rilke. As Christ in the parable of the rich young man demands the abandonment of all treasures, so in this book the poet sees the coming of the kingdom. The fulfillment of all our longings for an earnest to God when we have become simple again like little children and poor in possessions like God himself. In this phase of Rook's development, the principle of renunciation constitutes a certain negative element in his philosophy. The poet later proceeded to a positive acquiescence toward man's possessions at least those acquired or created in the domain of art. In our approach through the mystic we touch reality most deeply. It is because of this that all art and all philosophy culminate in their final forms in the crystallization of those values of life that remain forever inexplicable to pure reason. They become religious in the simple, profound sense of that word. Before the eternal facts of life, doubt and strife are reconciled into faith, will and pride change into humility. The realization of this truth expressed in the medium of poetry is the significance of Rilke's Book of Hours. A distinguished Scandinavian writer has pronounced Das Stunden Butch one of the supreme literary achievements of our time and its deepest and most beautiful book of prayer. In his subsequent poetic work Rilke did not again reach the sustained high quality of this book, the mood and idea of which he incorporated into a prose work of exquisite lyrical beauty the sketch of Malt Larid's Brig. In New Poems 1907 and New Poems Second Part 1908 the historical figure frequently taken from the Old Testament has grown beyond the proportions of life. It is weightier with fate and invariably becomes the means of expressing symbolically an abstract thought or a great human destiny. The Bishop presents the contrast between the dawning and the fading life, David singing before Saul shows the impatience of awakening ambition and Joshua is the man who forces even God to do his will. The Antichalenic world rises with shining splendor in the poems Irene to Sappho lament for Antinous, early Apollo and the archaic torso of Apollo. The spirit of the Middle Ages with its religious fervor and superstitious fanaticism is symbolized in several poems, the most important among which are the cathedral god in the Middle Ages. Saint Sebastian personifying martyrdom and the rose window, whose glowing magic is compared to the hypnotic power of the tiger's eye. Modern Paris is often the background of the new poems and the crass play of light and shadow upon the wags and masks of life's disillusioned in the morgue is caught with the same intense realistic vision as the flamingos and parrots spreading their varicolored soft plumage in the warmth of the sun in the avenue of the Jardin des Plantes. Almost all of the poems in these two volumes are short and precise. The images are portrayed with the sensitive intensity of impressionistic technique. The majestic quietude of the long lines of the book of pictures is broken, the colors are more vibrant, more scintillating, and the pictures are painted in nervous, darting strokes as though to convey the manner in which they were perceived in one single all-absorbing glance. For this reason many of these new poems are not quite free from a certain element of virtuosity. On the other hand, Rilke achieves at times a perfect surety of rapid stroke as in the poem The Spanish Dancer who rises luminously on the horizon of our inner vision like a circling element of fire, gleaming and blinding in the momentum of her movements. Degas and Zuloga seem to have combined their art on one canvas to give to this dancer the abundant elasticity of grace and the splendid fantasy of color. Many of the themes in the new poems bear testimony to the fact that Rook traveled extensively prior to the writing of these volumes in Italy, Germany, France, and Scandinavia.
His book on the five painters at the artist's colony at Warp Suite, where he remained for a time entirely given over to the observation of the atmosphere, the movement of the sky, and the play of light upon the far heath of this northern landscape, is an introduction to every interpretation of the work of landscape painters, and a tender poem to a land whose solitary and melancholy beauty entered into his own work. More vital than the influence of the personalities and the art treasures of the countries which Rilke visited and more potent in its effect upon his creations. Like a great sun over the most fruitful years of his life stands the towering personality of August Rodin. The new poems bear the dedication. Among Grand Ami August Rodin. Indicating the twofold influence which the French sculptor wielded over the poet, that of a friend and that of an artist, one recalls the broad, solidly built figure of Rodin with his rugged features and high, finely chiseled forehead. Moving slowly among the white glistening marble busts and statues as a giant in an old legend moves among the rocks and mountains of his realm patient, all enduring the man who has mastered life, strong and tempered by the storms of time. And one thinks of Rainer Maria Rilke, young blonde, with his slender aristocratic figure, the slightly bent forward figure of one who on solitary walks meditates much and intensely with his sensitive full mouth and the firm structure of the eyebrow gladly sunk in the shadow of contemplation. The face full of dreams and with an expression of listening to some distant music, from no other book of his not excepting the book of ours, can we deduce so accurate a conception of Rook's philosophy of life and art as we can draw from his comparatively short monograph on August Rodin. Rook sees in Rodin the dominant personification in our age of the power of servitude in all nature. For this reason the book on Rodin is far more than a purely aesthetic valuation of the sculptor's work Rilke traces throughout the book the strongly ethical principle which works itself out in every creative act in the realm of art. This grasp of the deeper significance of all art gives to the book on Rodin its well religious aspect of thought and its hymn-like rhythm of expression. It begins. Rodin was solitary before fame came to him, and afterward, he became perhaps still more solitary. Or fame is ultimately but the summary of all misunderstandings that crystallize about a new name. And he sums up this one man's greatness. Sometime it will be realized what has made this great artist so supreme. He was as a worker whose only desire was to penetrate with all his forces into the humble and the difficult significance of his tool. Therein lay a certain renunciation of life, but in just this renunciation lay his triumph for life entered into his work. Rodin became to Rook a manifestation of the divine principle of the creative impulse in man. Thus Rook's monograph on August Rodin will remain the poet's testament on life and art. Rook has lived deeply, he has absorbed into his artistic and spiritual consciousness many of the supreme values of our time. His art holds the mystic depth of the Slav, the musical strength of the German, and the visual clarity of the Latin. As artist, he has felt life to be sacred, and as a priest he has brought to its altar many offerings. New York City, Autumn 1918 First Poems Evening The bleak fields are asleep, my heart alone wakes the evening in the harbor down his red sails takes. Night, guardian of dreams, now wanders through the land, the moon, the lily-white blossoms within her hand. How came, how came from out thy night, Mary, so much light and so much gloom, who was thy bridegroom? Thou callest, thou callest, and thou hast forgot that thou the same art not who came to me in thy virginity. I am still so blossoming, so young. How shall I go on tiptoe from childhood to annunciation through the dim twilight into thy garden? The Book of Pictures I am like a flag unfurled in space, I sent the oncoming winds and must bend with them while the things beneath are not yet stirring, while doors close gently and there is silence in the chimneys hung. The windows do not yet tremble and the dust is still heavy, then I feel the storm and am vibrant like a sea and expand and withdraw into myself and thrust myself forth and am alone in a great storm.
The leaves fall, fall as from far, like distant gardens withered in the heavens they fall with, slow and lingering descent. And in the nights the heavy earth, too, falls from out the stars into the solitude. Us, all doth fall. This hand of mine must fall and low. The other one it is the law. But there is one who holds this falling infinitely softly in his hands. Whoever weeps somewhere out in the world weeps without cousin the world weeps over me. Whoever laughs somewhere out in the night laughs without cousin the night laughs at me. Whoever wanders somewhere in the world wanders in vain and the world wanders to me. Whoever dies somewhere in the world dies without cause in the world looks at me. They all have tired mouths and luminous, illimitable souls and a longing as if for sin trembles at times through their dreams. They all resemble one another in God's garden. They are silent like many, many intervals in his mighty melody. But when they spread their wings, they awaken the winds that stir as though God with his far-reaching master hands turned the pages of the dark book of beginning. Solitude is like a rain that from the sea at dusk begins to rise. It floats remote across the far-off plain upward into its dwelling place, the skies, then over the town it slowly sinks again. Like rain it softly falls at that dim hour when ghostly lanes turn toward the shadowy morn when bodies weighed with satiate passion's power sad disappointed from each other turn. When men with quiet hatred burning deep together in a common bed must sleep through the gray phantom shadows of the dawn low. Solitude floats down the river one. Kings and legends. Kings and old legends seem like mountains rising in the evening light. They blind all with their gleam, their loins encircled are by girdles bright, their robes are edged with bands of precious stones, the rarest earth affords with richly jeweled hands, they hold their slender, shining naked swords. The knight rides forth in coat of mail into the roar of the world. And here is life, the vines and the veil, and friend, and foe, and the feast in the hall, and may, and the maid, and the glen, and the grail, God's flags afloat on every wall, and a thousand streets unfurled. Beneath the armor of the night, behind the chains, black links, death crutches, and thinks, and thinks. When will the sword's blade sharp and bright forth from the scabbard spring, and cut the network of the cloak in meshing new ring on ring, when will the foe's delivering strokes set me free to dance and sing? I wish I might become like one of these who in the night on horses wild astride with torches flaming out like loosened hair unto the chase through the great swift wind ride. I wish to stand as on a boat and dare the sweeping storm, mighty like flag unrolled in darkness, but with helmet made of gold that shimmers restlessly. And in a row behind me in the dark, ten men that glow with helmets that are restless too, like mine, now old and dull, now clear as glass they shine. One stands by me and blows a blast apace on his great flashing trumpet, and the sound shrieks through the vast black solitude around through which, as through a wild mad dream we race. The houses fall behind us on their knees, before us bend the streets, and then we gain the great squares yield to us, and then we seize, and on our steeds rush like the roar of rain. Whosoever thou art, out in the evening roam, out from thy room thou knowst in every part, and far in a dim distance, leave thy home, whosoever thou art. Lift thine eyes which lingering see the shadows on the foot-worn threshold fall. Lift thine eyes slowly to the great dark tree that stands against heaven solitary tall, and thou hast visioned life. Its meanings rise like words that in the silence clearer grow as they unfold before. I will too no gently withdraw thine eyes. Strange violin! Dost thou follow me? In many foreign cities. Far away, thy lone voice spoke to me like memory. Do hundreds play thee, or does but one play? Are there in all great cities tempest-tossed men who would seek the rivers but for thee? Who but for thee would be forever lost? I drift, thy lonely voice always to me. I am, a neighbor always of those who forced to sing my trembling strings.
Life is more heavy, thy song says, than the vast heavy burden of all things. Who so loveth me that he will give his precious life for me? I shall be set free from the stone if someone drowns for me in the sea. I shall have life, life of my own, for life I ache. I long for the singing blood, the stone is so still and cold. I dream of life, life is good. Will no one love me and be bold and me wake? I weep and weep alone, weep always for my stone. What joy is my blood to me if it ripens like red wine? It cannot call back from the sea the life that was given for mine, given for love's sake. Maidens Others must by a long dark way stray to the mystic bards, or ask someone who has heard them sing or touch the magic chords. Only the maidens question, not the bridges that led to dream their luminous smiles, are like strands of pearls on a silver vase agleam. The maiden's doors of life led out where the song of the poet soars, and out bond to the great world, to the world bound the doors. Maidens Maidens, the poets learn from you to tell how solitary and remote you are, as night is lighted by one high bright star, they draw light from the distance where you dwell. Poor poet, you must always maiden be, even though his eyes the woman in you wake wedding brocade, your fragile wrists would break mysterious elusive from him flee. Within his garden let him wait alone where benches stand expectant in the shade within the chamber where the lyre was played where he received you as the eternal one. Though it grows dark your voice and form no more his senses seek he now no longer sees a white robe fluttering under dark beech trees along the pathway where it gleamed before. He loves the long paths where no footfalls ring and he loves much the silent chamber where like a soft whisper through the quiet air he hears your voice far distant vanishing. A softly stealing echo comes again from crowds of men whom warily he shuns and many see there so his thought runs and tenderest memories are pierced with pain. Call me beloved! Call loud to me! I bride her vigil at the window keeps the evening wanes to dusk the dimness creeps down empty alleys of the old plant tree. Let thy voice enfold me close about or from this dark house lonely and remote through deep blue gardens where grey shows float. I will pour forth my soul with hands stretched out. Come no day. Lord! It is time. So great was summer's glow, thy shadows lay upon the dial's faces, and o'er wide spaces let thy tempests blow. Command to ripen the last fruits of thine, give to them two more burning days, and press the last sweetness into the heavy wine. He who has now no house will ne'er build one who is alone will now remain alone. He will wake, will read, will letters write through the long day and in the lonely night and restless solitary. He will rove where the leaves rustle, wind blown in the grove. Moonlight night. South German night. The ripe moon hangs above, weaving enchantment over the shadowy lee. From the old tower the hours fall heavily into the dark as though into the sea a rustle a call of night watch in the grove then for a while void silence fills the air and then a violin from god knows where awakes and slowly sings oh love oh love again the woods are odorous the lark lifts on up soaring wings the heaven gray that hung above the treetops veiled and dark where branches bare disclosed the empty day After long rainy afternoons an hour comes with its shafts of golden light and flings them at the windows in a radiant shower, and raindrops beat the panes like timorous wings. Then all is still. The stones are crooned to sleep by the soft sound of rain that slowly dies and cradled in the branches hidden deep in each bright bud a slumbering silence lies. Memories of a Childhood A darkness hung like richness in the room when, like a dream, the mother entered there, and then a glass's tinkle stirred there near where a boy sat in the silent gloom. The room betrayed the mother, so she felt she kissed her boy and questioned. 
and with a gesture that he held most dear down for a moment by his side she knelt toward the piano. They both shyly glanced for she would sing to him on many a night, and the child seated in the fading light would listen strangely as if half entranced. His large eyes fastened with a quiet glow upon the hand which by her ring seemed bent and slowly wandering or the white keys went moving as though against a drift of snow. Before us great death stands our fate held close within his quiet hands. When with proud joy we lift life's red wine to drink deep of the mystic shining cup and ecstasy through all our being leaps death bows his head and weeps. A shanty yard in declimitation, Paris. No vision of exotic southern countries, no dancing women, supple, brown and tall, whirling from out their falling draperies to melodies that beat a fierce mad call. No sound of songs that from the hot blood rise, no languorous, stretching dusky, velvet, maids flashing like gleaming weapon, their bright eyes, no swift, wild thrill, the quickening blood pervades. Only mouths widening with a still broad smile of comprehension, a strange knowing leer at white men at their vanity and guile, and understanding that fills one with fear. The beasts in cages much more loyal are restlessly pacing, pacing to and fro, dreaming of countries, beckoning from afar, lands where they roamed in days of long ago. They burn with an unquenched, unsmothered fire consumed by longings over which, they brood oblivious of time without desire, alone and lost in their great solitude. Expectant and waiting you muse on the great rare thing which alone to enhance your life you would choose the awakening of the stone, the deeps where yourself you would lose. In the dusk of the shelves embossed shine the volumes in gold and browns and you think of countries once crossed of pictures of shimmering gowns of the women that you have lost. And it comes to you, then at last, and you rise, for you are aware of a year in the far-off past way, its wonder and fear and prayer. What play you, oh boy? Through the garden it stole like wandering steps, like a whisper then mute, what play you, oh boy? Oh! Your gypsying soul is caught and held fast in the pipes of Pan's flute. And what conjure you? Imprisoned is the song it lingers, and longs in the reeds where it lies. Your young life is strong, but how much more strong is the longing that through your music sighs? Let your flute be still and your soul float through waves of sound formless as waves of the sea, for here your song lived and it wisely grew before it was forced into melody. Its wings beat gently, its note no more calls, its flight has been spent by you, dreaming boy. Now it no longer steals over my walls, but in my garden, I woo it to joy. A young knight comes into my mind as from some myth of old. He came. You felt yourself and wind as a great storm would round you wind. He went. A blessing undefined seemed left as when church bells declined and left you wrapped in prayer. You fain would cry aloud, but bind your scarf about you and tear blind, weep softly in its fold. A young knight comes into my mind full armored forth to fair. His smile was luminously kind like glint of ivory enshrined, like a home longing, undivined, like Christmas snows where dark ways wind, like sea pearls about turquoise twined, like moonlight silver when combined with a loved book's rare gold. Paris in May 1903 The white-veiled maids to confirmation go through deep green garden paths, they slowly wind their childhood, they are leaving now behind, the future will be different, they know. Oh? Will it come? They wait, it must come soon. The next long hour slowly strikes at last, the whole house stirs again, the feast is past and sadly passes by the afternoon. Like resurrection were the garments white, the wreathed procession walked through trees arched wide into the church, as cool as silk inside with long owls of tall candles flaming bright. The lights all shone like jewels rich and rare, two solemn eyes that watched them gleam and flare. 
and through the silence the great song rose high up to the vaulted dome like clouds it soared then luminously gently down it poured over white veils like rain it seemed to die the wind through the white garments softly stirred and they grew varicolored in each fold and each fold hidden blossoms seemed to hold and flowers on stars and fluting notes of bird and dim quaint figures shimmering like gold seemed to come forth from distant myths of old outside the day was one of green and blue with touches of a luminous glowing red across the quiet pond the small waves sped Beyond the city gardens, hidden from view, scent odors of sweet blossoms, on the breeze and singing sounded through the far-off trees. It was as though garlands crowned everything and all things were touched softly by the sun and many windows opened one by one and the light trembled on them, glistening. Ah, yes! I long for you. To you I glide and lose myself, for to you I belong. The hope that hitherto I have denied imperious comes to me as from your side serious, unfaltering, and swift and strong. Those times, the times when I was quite alone by memories, rapt that whispered to me low my silence, was the quiet of a stone over which rippling, murmuring waters flow. But in these weeks of the awakening spring something within me has been freed something that in the past dark years unconsciously which rises now within me and commands and gives my poor warm life into your hands who know not what I was that yesterday. Upon the bridge the blind man stands alone, gray like a mist-veiled monument, he towers as though of nameless realms the boundary stone about which circle distant starry hours. He seems the center around which stars glow while all Earth's ostentations surge below. Immovably and silently, he stands placed where the confused current ebbs and flows past fathomless dark depths that he commands in a shallow generation drifting goes. Gee, thinks I am, have you not seen? Who are you then, Marie? I am a queen, I am a queen. To your knee, to your knee. And then she weeps, I was a child. Who were you then, Marie? Know you that I was no man's child, poor and in rags, said she. And then a princess, I became to whom men bend their knees to princes, things are not the same as those a beggar sees. And those things which have made you great came to you, tell me when? One night, one night, one night, quite late, things became different then. I walked the lane which presently with strong chords seemed to bend then Marie became melody and danced from end to end. The people watched with startled mien and passed with frightened glance for all know that only a queen may dance in the lane's dance. A man. Oh? All things are long passed away and far. A light is shining, but the distant star from which it still comes to me has been dead a thousand years, and the dim phantom boat that glided past some ghastly thing was said. A clock just struck within some house remote. Which house? I long to still my beating heart. Beneath the sky's vast dome, I long to pray, of all the stars, there must be far away a single star which still exists apart. And I believe that I should know the one which has alone endured, and which alone, like a white city, that all space commands at the ray's end in the high heaven stands. From infinite longings finite deeds rise as fountains spring toward far-off glowing skies. But rushing swiftly upward weakly bend, and trembling from their lack of power descend so through the falling torrent of our fears our joyous force leaps like these dancing tears. You pawned. Early Apollo. As when at times their breaks through branches bear a morning vibrant with the breath of spring about this put that a splendor rare transforms it almost to a mortal thing. There is as yet no show in his glance to cool his temples for the laurel's glow but later o'er those marble brows perchance a rose garden with bushes tall will grow. And single petals one by one will fall, or the still mouth and break its silent thrall, 
the mouth that trembles with a dawning smile as though a song were rising there the while. The tomb of a young girl. We still remember. The same as of your all that has happened once again must be. As grows a lemon tree upon the shore it was like that your light, small breasts you bore and his blood's current course like the wild sea. That God who was the wanderer, the slim despoiler of fair women, he the wise, but sweet and glowing as your thoughts of him who cast a shadow over your young limb while bending like your arched brows were your eyes. You are! From me, you ever take your flight, your swift wings wound me as they were along without you void would be my day and night without you I'll not capture my great song. I have no earthly spot where I can live, I have no love, I have no household fane, and all the things to which myself, I give impoverish me with richness they attain. The Panther Its weary glance from passing by the bars, has grown into a dazed and vacant stare, it seems to him there are a thousand bars, and outbound those bars the empty air. The pad of his strong feet, that ceaseless sound of supple tread behind the iron bands is like a dance of strength circling around, while in the circle, stunned, a great will stands. But there are times the pupils of his eyes dilate, the strong limbs stand alert apart, tense with the flood of visions that rise only to sink and die within his heart. Among all the others, there sat a guest who sipped her tea as if one apart, and she held her cup not quite like the rest once she smiled, so it pierced one's heart. When the group of people rose at last and laughed and talked in a merry tone, as lingeringly through the rooms they passed I saw that she followed alone. Tense and still like one who to sing must rise before a throng on a festal night, she lifted her head and her bright glad eyes were like pools which reflected light. She followed on slowly after the last as though some object must be passed by, and yet as if were it once, but past she would no longer walk but fly. The Spanish Dancer As a lit match first flickers in the hands before it flames and darts out from all sides bright, twitching tongues, so ringed by growing bands of spectators, she quivering glowing stands poised tensely for the dance, then forward glides and suddenly becomes a flaming torch. Her bright hair flames, her burning glances scorch, and witted daring art at her command, her whole robe blazes like a firebrand from which is stretched each naked arm awake, gleaming and rattling like a frightened snake. And then, as though the fire fainter grows, she gathers up the flame again, it glows as with proud gesture, and imperious air she flings it to the earth. And it lies there furiously flickering and crackling still then haughtily victorious, but with sweet, swift smile of greeting. She puts forth her will and stamps the flames out with her small, firm feet. My body glows in every vein and blooms to fullest flower since I first knew thee. My walk unconscious pride and power assumes who art thou then thou who waitest me. When from the past I draw myself the while, I lose old traits as leaves of autumn fall, I only know the radiance of they smile like the soft gleam of stars, transforming all. Through childhood's years, I wandered unaware of shimmering visions, my thoughts now rest to offer thee as on an altar fair, that's lighted by the bright flame of thy hair, and rated by the blossoms of thy breasts. Of saw. When my soul touches yours a great chord sings. How shall I tune it then to other things? That some spot in darkness could be found that does not vibrate when you're your death's sound. But out of everything that touches you and me welds us as played strings sound one melody. Where is the instrument whence the sounds flow? And who's a master hand that holds the bow? Sweet song. Arcade Torso of Apollo We cannot fathom his mysterious head through the veiled eyes no flickering ray is sent but from his torso gleaming light is shed as from a candelabrum inward bent his glance there glows and lingers. Otherwise the round breast would not blind you with its grace nor could the soft curved circle of the thighs steal to the arc whence issues a new race.
Nor could this stark and stunted stone display vibrance beneath the shoulder's heavy bar, nor shine like fur upon a beast of prey, nor break forth from its lines like a great star. There is no spot that does not bind you fast and transport you back, back to a far past. The Book of Hours The Book of a Monk's Life I live my life in circles that grow wide and endlessly unroll. I may not reach the last, but on I glide strong, pinioned toward my goal. About the old tower, dark against the sky, the beat of my wings hums. I circle about God, sweep far and high on through millenniums. Am I a bird that skims the clouds along, or am I a wild storm, or a great song? Many have painted her. But there was one who drew his radiant colors from the sun, mysteriously glowing through a background, dim when he was suffering. She came to him, and all the heavy pain within his heart rose in his hands and stole into his art. His canvas is the beautiful bright veil through which her sorrow shines. There where the texture or her sad lips is closely drawn, a trembling smile softly begins to dawn. Though angels with seven candles light the place, you cannot read the secret of her face. In cassocks clad I have had many brothers in southern cloisters where the laurel grows. They paint madonnas like fair human mothers, and I dream of yentitians and of others in which the god with shining radiance glows. But though my vigil constantly, I keep my god is dark like woven texture flowing a hundred drinking roots all intertwined. I only know that from his warmth I'm growing. More, I know not my roots lie hidden deep, my branches only are swayed by the wind. Thou anxious one! And dost thou then not hear against thee all my surging senses sing? About thy face in circles drawing near my thought floats like a fluttering white wing. Dost thou not see before thee stands my soul in silence wrapped my springtime's prayer to pray? But when thy glance rests on me, then my whole being quickens and blooms like trees in me. When thou art dreaming, then I am thy dream, but when thou art awake, I am thy will potent with splendor, radiant and sublime, expanding like far space starlit and still into the distant mystic realm of time. I love my life's dark hours in which my senses quicken and grow deep, while as from faint incense of faded flowers or letters old, I magically steep myself in days gone by again, I give myself unto the past again alive. Out of my dark hours wisdom dawns apace, infinite life unrolls its boundless space. And I am shaken as a sweeping storm shakes a ripe tree that grows above a grave round whose cold clay the roots twine fast and warm and youth's fair visions that glowed bright and brave. Dreams that were closely cherished and for long are lost once more in sadness and in song. The Book of Pilgrimage By day thou art the legend and the dream that like a whisper floats about all men the deep and brooding stillnesses which seem after the hour has struck too close again. And when the day with drowsy gesture bends and sinks to sleep beneath the evening skies as from each roof a tower of smoke ascends so does thy realm my god round me rise. All those who seek thee tempt thee and those who find would bind thee to gesture and to form. But I would comprehend thee as the wide earth unfolds, thee. Thou growest with my maturity, thou art in calm and storm. I ask of thee no vanity to evidence and prove thee. Thou word in ends old. Perform no miracles for me, but justify thy laws to me, which, as the years pass by me, all soundlessly unfold. And a house was one who arose from the feast and went forth to wander in distant lands, because there was somewhere far off in the east a spot which he sought where a great church stands. And ever his children, when breaking their bread, thought of him and rose up and blessed him as dead. 
and another house was the one who had died, who still sat at table and drank from the glass and ever within the walls did abide for out of the house he could no more pass. And his children set forth to seek for the spot where stands the great church which he forgot. Extinguish my eyes, I still can see you close my ears, I can hear your footsteps fall, and without feet, I still can follow you, and without voice, I still can to you call. Break off my arms, and I can embrace you and fold you with my heart as with a hand. Hold my heart, my brain will take fire of you as flax ignites from a lit firebrand, and flame will sweep in a swift rushing flood through all the singing currents of my blood. In the deep nights I dig for you, O oh treasure, to seek you over the wide world, I roam, for all abundance is but meager measure of your bright beauty which is yet to come. Over the road to you the leaves are blowing, few follow it, the way is long and steep. You dwell in solitude, O, oh, does your glowing heart in some far-off valley lie asleep? My bloody hands with digging bruised, I've lifted spread like a tree, I stretch them in the air to find you before day, to night has drifted, I reach out into space to seek you there. And as the way a swift impatient gesture flashing from distant stars on sweeping wing, you come and over earth, a magic vesture steals gently as the rain falls in the spring. Her mouth is like the mouth of a fine bust that cannot utter sound, nor breathe nor kiss, but that had once from life received all this which shaped its subtle curves, and ever must from fullness of past knowledge dwell alone, a thing apart, a parable in stone. Alone thou wanderest through space, profound one with a hidden face, thou art poverty's great rose, the eternal metamorphose of gold into the light of sun. Thou art the mystic homeless one into the world thou never came, too mighty, thou too great to name voice of the storm, song that the wild wind sings, the harp that shatters those who play thy strings. A watcher of thy spaces make me, make me a listener at thy stone, give to me vision, and then wake me upon thy oceans all alone. Thy river's courses, let me follow where. They leap the crags in their flight, and where at dusk in caverns hollow they croon to music of the night. Send me far into thy barren land where the snow clouds the wild wind drives, where monasteries like grey shrouds stand august symbols of unlived lives. Their pilgrims climb slowly one by one, and behind them a blind man goes with him. I will walk till day is done up the pathway that no one knows.